So joining me for this episode is my longtime good friend, Paco Sirisi. Paco, we've been delinquent on having you on the channel. This has been uh, a long time coming, but uh, I'm glad we're able to connect. Let's talk about your time as a naval aviator. So you started, after you got your wings, you started life as an A6 pilot. Yeah, right out of flight school, I put down, uh, you know, we have, we have a dream sheet, they call it the Navy, the, the things that you'd like to do or fly or where you'd like to live. Uh, my dream sheet was West Coast Tomcats, East Coast Tomcats, West Coast A6s, West Coast Hornets, something like that. Um, obviously, you didn't get Tomcats right away. Went up to uh, Whidbey Island to go to the uh, A6 RAG. And, um, you know, it was, I was immediately struck by the, the strength of that community, uh, the amazing um, dedication that these people had to their community. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that they were way up in the Pacific Northwest, kind of all by themselves. Uh, they had a few prowlers on base as well, but it really was an A6 only community and they, they really loved it. So it was cool to get sucked into that. My first squadron after completing the A6 RAG was VA-155. Uh, it was an amazing squadron. I joined them the day they came back from uh, the first Gulf War. So it was a, it was a storied squadron. They had a lot of incredible successes uh, and unfortunately one loss, uh, one combat loss. Um, so it was, it was a great honor to jump into that squadron, into that community, learn about, you know, flying low levels day, night, to learn uh, ordnance on target on time. Uh, and I did that for a full tour, uh, two workups in the deployment. And then uh, we were scheduled to, we'd known for a long time, we were the uh, first A6 squadron to get decommissioned out of the community. And the plan was for all the younger guys like myself to finish our last six months or so of fleet stuff in our sister squadron, VA-145, there in Air Wing 2. We found out that about a month or two into my term at VA-145, that that squadron was also going to get decommissioned. So, uh, I mean, you know, when one door closes, another one opens. Uh, my options were to either be a, an A6 RAG instructor and stay in a, that community, which looked like it was... Uh, accurately looked like it was uh, sort of going to be dying quicker than everybody thought or put in a package to go fly something else. Uh, and obviously I'd always wanted to be a Tomcat guy. I had gotten a backseat ride on F-14 in Miramar as a midshipman. And that, you know, it set the hooks really deep in me to, uh, to want to go fly that airplane. A recent stunning survey revealed that more than half of Americans who make six figures are now living paycheck to paycheck. That's just mind blowing. College educated people with high paying jobs struggling to do basic things like pay the rent and make their car payments. Combine that with the fact that over a third of Americans have more credit card debt than emergency savings, and it's clear that a financial storm is brewing, and it's likely that nobody is safe. But if you think that experts are letting their money waste away in savings accounts or the stock market, think again. They're pouring hundreds of millions into assets that aren't necessarily correlated to the stock market. And these experts know that historically the asset with the lowest correlation to the stock market of any major asset class has been contemporary art. Masterworks is the platform that lets you invest in multi-million dollar paintings without breaking the bank. Masterworks has built an impressive track record of 11 exits, all of them profitable. Now with those kinds of results, demand is high and Masterworks has seen over 657,000 members looking to take advantage of the investment potential of art. So there's a wait list but they've given viewers of my channel VIP access to their latest offerings. To skip the wait list, just check the exclusive link in the episode description below. Uh, so I put in a package uh, when I found out I was gonna be in another squadron that was decommissioning and uh, you know, found out a few months later that I was indeed gonna go fly the F-14. So which squadron did you get assigned to? So I went to the East Coast for uh, 101, which is where I met you actually. Um, and then, um, that was an awesome year. Fantastic going through the RAG as a, you know, I was a Cat 1 RAG student, but I had almost three years of fleet and I, you know, multiple hundred traps. I'd been top, uh, top nugget. So, I, you know, I felt very comfortable in that environment and learning a lot of my, um, a lot of my training command friends were RAG instructors and fleet buddies were RAG instructors too. So it was super comfortable. Grumman to Grumman was a lot of uh, easy common uh, commonalities between the intruder and, and the Tomcat. So uh, it was actually a super fun year going through the RAG in the F-14 in Oceana. And then I went out to uh, the West Coast, VF-213, for my fleet tour out there. And in which year was that that you joined 213? I joined 213 in, 
it was the summer of 94. It was a week after, or maybe just a few days after Carol Green's crash. Okay. You're flying F-14As at that time. Yeah. We um, called it the A minus, but yeah. A minus, right. <laughs> and uh, the, the, that squadron was having some, uh, some challenges. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm just purely by chance drinking out of my black line and mug here. It. That's really thrown into the deep end. But as you said, and I used to love it when uh, I get crewed with uh, an A6 transition guy because of what you're saying. You had, you know, a full tour, Grumman to Grumman. So let, let me ask you what, in the most general sense, uh, was the difference between flying the A6 and flying the Tomcat? Well, I mean, there are a lot of obvious, obvious differences. You know, one is a supersonic fighter. Uh, one's a you know, in the weeds, medium bomber, you know, the, the engineers probably had diagrams that they were sharing back and forth. Cause a lot of the hydraulics and electrical and all the buttons look the same. Um, it flew. I mean, it, it was, it was all radically different other than the guts. Um, it flew incredibly differently. The community was different. Um, the A6 is built around the, or was built around the, that radar, the terrain following radar. And it was really a BN's airplane. So the pilot was a chauffeur in essence. And the bombardier navigator worked his magic or her magic to make the pilot, uh, to enable the pilot to get the plane to the target. Flying low level 200 feet at night through canyons. You know, all I did was put the thing in the thing and, and not crash. Uh, the navigator, <laughs> had already done days worth of chart study and shadow drawings. And, uh, you know, they, they really were responsible for getting the plane uh, to where it was supposed to be. And the F-14 community was much more 50-50. You know, I felt like it was a much more collaborative community, I thought. The planes themselves, you know, you can look at them on a, on a stick somewhere outside of a base and see how they're going to fly. The F-14 is sleek and, uh, you know, pointy nose, twin engines, wings that swept back. It was made to go fast, and um, and it did. The A6 had this enormous bulbous nose with a wart on its chin for the forward-looking infrared. Uh, and while, it, you know, it wasn't a slow airplane, it certainly wasn't anywhere near supersonic. It was made to dodge trees as it was winding its way through valleys uh, to get to the target, and it did that really well. And also the probe didn't retract. So the, the probe is always out there. Prominently yeah. displayed. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I did an episode last year from the flight deck of Midway, and they have a fully loaded A6 on the flight deck there. And I, I commented on how many bombs, how many Mark 80 series bombs you guys could carry in, in on that airplane. So like I said, not fast, but certainly potent uh, in terms of what it could do in the in the attack mission. So this is back in the days when we had the luxury, let's say, uh, WW Cold War, layman era, where we could have airplanes that specialized in very specific things. Um, when you look at how many type model series you and I had uh, in those days on the flight deck compared to now, which is basically, if you want to be very simplistic about it, two, you got the Hornet airframe and you've got E2s. Right. And again, that's a gross generalization. But the other thing, I, I like how you say there was more collaboration uh, in the, the Tomcat community. Um, what do you mean by by that uh, sort of specifically? You know, that the, the preponderance of the mission in the A6 was the BN and it was great. And, and they were amazing and they did an incredible job. And I was happy to support them in getting the plane and the bombs on target. It felt much more collaborative and, and like I said earlier, 50-50 in the Tomcat because we were all, everybody had to do their job really, really well to make it all work out. Well, plus it's more fluid, right? It, it's sort of like football yeah. versus hockey. Yeah. You, you had your strip chart. The target was fixed, um, you know, so you're, you're, that's where you're going to go. I mean, sometimes maybe you'd have a pop-up target or, or you know, because of the SAM threat, you'd have to audible. But generally, as you described at the outset, you're following the cues that the BN gives you, um, both for terrain avoidance and for hitting, hitting the target. During a 4VX intercept, there's just so much 
entropy, let's say, um, that it, it, it takes a lot more fluidity, coordination. Um, I think some of the A6 pilots that, that I flew with that maybe didn't make the leap were guys who couldn't process that, let's call it the third dimension, um, which is, I think this is between being an attack pilot and being a fighter pilot, is um, that ability to play hockey instead of football, as it, as it were, right? But I like the way you put it in terms of the high. So, you know, when, when everything clicks, meaning I've got a great radar where both my TAD and my DDD are working, you know, we got a good track wall scan picture, dive into the notch, that goes away, and then we come out, pull back in about 15 miles. So by the time you get back to some radar SA, maybe you're at 13 miles. So that's generally the Rio using the DDD. And to, so to be able to sort and relay to your wingman who's got what in accordance with contracts and then get missiles away. And, you know, at the end of all that, when the RTO says, knock it off, and you realize everybody's still alive on your side and you got, maybe you killed everybody, it doesn't get any better. For me, like an indicator that something like that was going to go well was just the cadence of the comms. You know what I mean? Just at the very beginning, like literally on deck, you do your check in and it was like two, three, four. And you're like, OK, I think this is going to go all right. People are people are on step. So you mentioned Kara Holtgreen. Um, yeah. Obviously, I did that episode as one of my earliest episodes, my, my first uh, super popular episode. And in it, I describe the challenge of flying the Tomcat around the ship. How did that strike you? Again, compare flying an F-14A case one, case three to an A-6E. It was, uh, it was dramatically different. I mean, so that, you know, to get into the weeds of it, the A-6 had a 45 degree wing sweep. It had a lot of drag. Uh, there was no lift provided by the body. The J-52 engines were instantaneous response. So, you know, you pull power of the plane, the VSI starts to go down. You don't have to really fiddle with the nose at all. Very stable. Uh, I thought it was an incredibly easy airplane to land. I was a top 10 ball flyer in the A6 as a nugget, um, which, you know, made me think that I was a really good ball flyer. Turns out I was pretty average when I got into a Tomcat, maybe a little bit above average, but I was certainly not a top 10 ball flyer. Um, the difference between the Tomcat and uh, the A6 was, you know, it had a 20 degree wing sweep. About a third of the lift of the airplane was from the fuselage itself. The TF-30 engines had a huge lag to them. So, you know, you would have to make corrections to your vertical speed uh, using anticipated throttle movements and, and, and repositioning of the throttle before the engine would actually go down and back up. And then you'd have to nudge the nose a little bit to sort of influence the vertical speed. If you just pull the power back, the plane would just continue on its current glide slope and just get slower. It was a lot more complicated and it was much wider, 54 foot wingspan, which gave you just the tiniest bit of clearance on, uh, on either side of the landing area. Um, both airplanes, ne neither airplane had an aileron, so that wasn't that big of a difference. But uh, the Tomcat had this zone where you could move the stick slightly back and forth and it would just, uh, just the uh, horizontal stab stabilizers would move. And if you went a little too far, then all of a sudden the the flapper arm would come up and, and or the spoiler would come up and, and, and the wing would pivot instead of rolling like an aileron would, it would just pivot down. It would kill lift on that wing. So it was dramatically more complicated uh, and more difficult than flying the intruder for me. Um, you know, that said, we had uh, Killer Killian in my squadron who was the most incredible ball flyer I ever saw. And he was consistently in the top two or three in the air wing flying the F-14. Uh, it was just a, a piece of art watching him land on the ship. So uh, it was a it was a challenge for me. Uh, I mean, I never I was never really great at landing the Tomcat, but it was never I never had a day in the barrel or a night in the barrel. Um, you know, one bolter here and there, but you know, every once in a while you'd hear stories about guys who would have bolted two, three, four, five, six times before managing to trap. I know that you pivoted into the reserves as an aggressor pilot. So talk to us about uh, how that. And that went down at the time I thought, all right, I'm just going to, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to be one of those guys that hangs on and, you know, pretends he was a, he's still a fighter pilot, even though he's just an airline pilot. Uh, but I did. 
<laughs> you were that guy. <laughs> I did. I do it exactly that. You know, I got out. I just quit cold turkey, uh, and then uh, about three months later, and I'm, it was tough. I mean, it's like kicking heroin. You know, I mean, you know, no more JP five, no more G's, no more ready room, no more coming into the break at five hundred knots. You know, I was wearing a short sleeve white shirt with a black tie, <laughs> dragging oh. a pack to the airport. It was practically suicidal. And um, a buddy of mine called me up who had been in 213, who was now active duty up in Fallon, flying F5s. And he's like, hey, man, we're having a board. We're, we're going to pick up a couple of new guys to come fly in the aggressors. Do you want to put a package in? And I was like, oh, my God, yes, please. Put me on the methadone. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, so you, you were living in, now let me get this straight. You went through the RAG uh, at, at Oceana, but you were served in 213 out of yep. uh, Miramar. Exactly. Um, right. So we're kicking it old school. Miramar is still a naval, naval air station in these days. Yeah. Um, and so when you drop your letter, you get out, you guys are living in San Diego. You yeah. get with the airlines. And like you said, cold turkey, you're just this bus driver dork arcing yeah. around in, Super and, dork, in the yeah. lines, yeah. in the line for the Dunkin' Donuts, uh, you know, in, in gate five or wherever. Sad but, face. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, then you get the call. Come, yeah. So were you commuting between San Diego and Fallon once you were flying uh, with – which squadron was that that you were flying with VFC what up there? VFC 13. Okay. The Saints, yeah. Uh, so you're yeah, basically exactly. drilling with them in Fallon but uh -huh. living in San Diego. Yeah. It wasn't that it's, – it sounds like a pain in the ass, but it wasn't that But bad. what did you what, – so what, what were the logistics of that? Would you fly to Reno and then drive over or how did that go down? Yep. I bought a, like a 1972 Ford LTD with like a Mexican blanket, you know, upholstery and it burned like a three miles to the gallon, something like that. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it just lived at, at the national guard base in Reno, just got, you know, rained and snowed on, but it, it didn't care. It started every time I went there. So drive over to Fallon, took an hour and 15 minutes, show up at like um, 9 AM, you know, and fly twice and be back in the action. So how long did you do that uh, with those guys? Till 2007, 10 years. That's pretty much the life of Riley because you have your pride back now. When you're not in the major leagues, you're, you know, I was in AAA, whatever. But, you know, if you're not a deploying fleet pilot, you're support. Roger that. But, but when you're flying the F-5 in the aggressor role, you're kind of still in it. That's why I say it's like, it was like methadone. It was a step down. Yeah. You know? No, I think that's I'm no longer an heroin addict. I'm, I'm yeah. processing the, the addiction. Um, I'm not sure how many of my viewers can relate to all of our drug uh, analysis here, but uh, yeah. One of my squadron mates called the F5, you know, the JP5 powered crack pipe. You know, it's just, it's just what it was. It was, it was addicting. It, it, it was super fun. It was a perfect MiG-21 simulator. And at the time, you know, MiG-21 was still kind of the percentage threat in the world. So, uh, the MiG-21 was the, the highest likelihood aircraft that American pilots would face. You, like you said, you did that for, for 10 years. Um, yeah. So um, if I'm doing the math correctly, 2007, um, you you get out of the reserves. Or you're a commander in the reserves yeah. at that time. Um, so talk to us about how you pivoted into the very unorthodox world of, of filmmaking. I've always been a writer. I've been writing since I was in high school, various things. Uh, while I was still uh, on uh, in VFC 13, I would be writing articles for various publications. I, I wrote a screenplay. The, the, the goal of the movie prior to the movie coming to life was to make, uh, to tell a story of naval aviation that wasn't, you know, so based in the false world of the movie Top Gun, right? Everybody thinks they know everything about naval aviators from watching Top Gun, which, you know, anybody that's actually in the Navy knows is about 3% true. Um, and so, I, you know, I mean, we live, we live or lived in this incredibly dynamic, exciting world full of rich personalities. It really didn't need, you know, locker room scenes or people snapping their teeth at each other to, to tell a great story. And so that was my motivation to, to come up with something like that. Wrote a screenplay. It turned out it was horrible, um, but I still really wanted to tell our story. And I went into uh, this was maybe halfway through my five, uh, my ten years in the Saints. It was like two thousand and 
four. So maybe a little bit towards the end. Um, I, I went to see a documentary with a buddy of mine who's a, a big surfer. I, I don't surf, but it was a cool movie. It's called Step Into Liquid. And I was just blown away. I'm like, if you put flying scenes in where there's surfing scenes and all the interview scenes are pilots instead of surfers, that's already a pretty good movie. It's pretty exciting. And I just really appreciated the way that they made me feel like I was surfing, that the, the, the visual storytelling aspect, you know, it was different from sort of a traditional documentary where you're just watching something static and it can be a little boring. There's a lot of talking heads. It was very dynamic. The cinematography was incredible. So I, w I literally walked out of the movie theater and I called a friend of mine who, um, a very good friend who's a film director in a commercial movie director um and i pitched her the idea hey listen i just saw this documentary i want to make a documentary about uh fighter pilots about and at the time i was thinking just the saints because it was such an unusual squadron we were kind of the last squadron of adversaries at the time i was discounting vfc 12 on purpose uh you know sort of building the story around this mystical squadron in the desert that concentrated on the dying art of bfm and, uh, you know, it was kind of, it kind of had a cool ring to it and it was some great visuals and I pitched her on it. She's like, I don't think so. It was female San Francisco resident has zero connection to the military. And I'm like, just come to Fallon, just bring your camera to Fallon for a weekend. And you know, if you don't like it, you don't like it. And if you do, maybe we'll make something happen. And so she does it. She rents a really nice camera, uh, comes out to Fallon talks to the guys, you know, I mean, naval aviators are funny and charming. She's a beautiful woman. She's five foot 10, massive, you know, black hair, tangled black hair, just, you know, they tripping all over themselves to make, you know, them seem, themsem themselves seem cool around her. Um, you know, we, we got some great flying scenes. The CEO at the time, Buckethead, who you may know, um, was like, sure, uh, you know, stick a camera in the back of the airplane, just, you know, keep it on the DL. So we got some actually really cool flying scenes. Well, did she up. go flying, or you just took the camera? No, no, no. One of the um, one of the other guys flew me in the F, and I was holding. I've never really operated a, a film camera before, but there's an eight millimeter film camera, and we choreographed some stuff, and you know we did some real cool canopy passes and and stuff like that. And we made this sizzle reel. Uh, first of all, she was hooked. I mean, it's it's easy to fall in love with that community and those people and the flying. It's just. You know, it's it's sort of romantic just in and of itself. Uh, and you can see that there's a story there somewhere. Um, so she was hooked and we made this amazing sizzle reel, which is, you know, this sort of a pitch product that you use. It's called The Last of the Dogfighters. And you can find it on YouTube. It's super fun. Uh, it's, it's really cool. There's some great video in there, some funny interview stuff. So, uh, you know, we made that and then I went out and you know, I, I, I literally bought a book like how to be a movie producer and I'm like reading through it. I was like, oh, I guess I got to raise some money and I got to, you know, go get permission from the Navy to continue with this process. And then in L.A. are the folks that you have to deal with to rent, in essence, uh, military equipment, hardware to go recreate dogfight scenes. And that was the other thing. You know, if you remember, I was talking about Sep and Liquid. I mean, the visuals were a huge part of our vision for making this film. It's not just the people talking about how much they love flying, but you know, the, the viewer being able to sit in the cockpit in essence and feel what it's like to fly and land on a ship and dogfight and drop bombs and stuff. That was a nightmare. It took probably two and a half years to get permission to, to film that. Um, and I, I mean, it, it came down to the wire. I finally was able to, get access to the four star down in San Diego, uh, the, uh, the air boss, uh, commander of Naval air forces, um, in like the spring of 2006. So anybody that knows the Tomcat knows that it went away in September of 2006. And there was one last Fallon debt, uh, VF 32 with Puck Howe as the CEO. And I got permission in like March and they showed up in June. It was just, I mean, by the skin of our teeth, we were able to get the, you know, the scenes we needed for the film after two and a half years of production and, and you know, money, lots of money going out. Investors were promised that they would, you know, have these awesome scenes. So the human element is the profiles of, of basically two 
yeah. naval avi- two Tomcat pilots who, by the way, I knew them when they were midshipmen. So yeah, it's crazy. and Megan, I, I knew during my final tour on active duty uh, teaching at the Naval Academy. Um, so that was kind of a small world sort of deal. Uh, but this is what I think makes Speed and Angels more than just a surf movie is yeah. the profiles of those those two. So that that's not something that you planned, right? I mean, this just is what kind of unfolded, yeah. Yeah. you know, when you just, you have the cameras there and you're allowed access and now you just kind of get out of the way as right. the producer, right? Much like flying a, you know, a 4V unknown intercept in the F-14, there's a lot of unknowns when you're filming a documentary specifically, uh, an unscripted show about real people, like, for real, not, you know, like a TV, uh, you know, unscripted show. This is a no shit unscripted show. Um, And like I said, we intended, I intended to make a movie about how cool the saints were. Turns out a 90 minute show about 40 some year old men who are, you know, think they're just hanging on to (laughs) the last vestiges of dignity by flying adversary planes, Um, you know, little Pinocchio syndrome, didn't want to grow up. Still a good movie. The sizzle reel is great. Um, Peyton was in a van in Key West going from the BOQ to the base. Um, and like I said earlier, we, we, we had to struggle with our deployments to Key West. It's rigorous duty. But uh, we're down there and, and uh, we're, we're supporting the um, Tomcat rag. And she just happens to be in a van with Megan. And this scene is actually in the movie. Um, She's sitting there in the van. She's the last one to jump in. Megan's down there. She's the coffee mess officer. It's the second to last class. So Megan's, I think, going to be in the last class. So she's the coffee mess officer. She's in charge of, like, you know, getting candy bars and and Cokes and coffee for the the people that are down there. And Peyton sits next to her. And they're kind of both like, hey, I know we're women, but I don't want to talk about the fact that we're women just because we're women. Uh, You know, a little prickly situation but Peyton's got her camera and she's like, so why are you here? You know, just casually. And literally that scene is the introduction scene for Megan and Speed and Angels. I wanted to fly um, jets in the Navy since I was like 12. I saw this movie called Top Gun. <laughs> what movie is that? I thought Maverick was the man. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And it became readily apparent that these 21, 22, 23 year old Tomcat students were way more exciting than the 40 something year old F5 pilots who thought they were very cool. Um, you know, in their, in their journey as freshly winged naval aviators uh, in the rag from, you know, know nothing, fully excited young puppies to the end of the rag where they're completing their training and literally going into combat because it's pretty hot in Iraq and Afghanistan at this time. Um, they, in the, in the one year time, they become seasoned and experience highs and lows like nothing that we could have shown with vfc 13. you know they they're starting off as you know idealistic enthusiastic thrill-seeking young people who all of a sudden have to learn how to fly this incredibly complicated airplane for the purpose of going into combat it's no longer like let's just learn how to fly a jet and this is super fun and cool. And so, you know, we're going to land in the aircraft carrier. Now it's like, you have missiles, you have bombs, you're going to be flying low levels. People die. Uh, when you're done with this in nine months, you're going to go to combat. You're going to be supporting people on the ground who need you to do your job or they will die. Um, there's a good chance that you're going to have to drop bombs on people that are threatening, you know, U S troops. And, it, and you can see that progression, that maturation process and that change of their perception of their jobs uh, through the course of the film. You know, they, it's kind of a sport car, like I love racing sports cars at the beginning and at the end, it's like, you know, if, if you've seen the film, Jay goes into combat. He is in combat and he is supporting troops on the ground by firing his gun in an urban environment, something he's never trained to do. Uh, and it's a life or death situation. That isn't a story arc like nothing we could have written. And it was all real. How long from the getting green lighted by NavInfo West um, and, and 
getting Peyton fully on board till the movie is in the can. How long was that? So we filmed the the F5s and F14s in Fallon in the summer of June of 2006. We had a few more things, cats and dogs to clean up after that. We, we ended up shooting some stuff with Jay and Hornet simulating that he's in, in a rhino, simulating that he's in a Tomcat because we needed some cockpit shots. Um, so it was maybe six more months of that. And it took six months to edit. I mean, we had 200 plus hours of footage um, and our editor, uh, you know, created this film, molded this film into a 96 minute, you know, from 200 hours down to 96 minutes, took her six months. I mean, we, we would walk into the editing suite and, you know, it looked like something out of a sci-fi movie. She'd have three or four screens up and a couple computers and she's operating different things with different, you know, different hands and pulling up footage and saying, how about this? How about this? What, what if we put these two together? And she's actually, uh, Jessica, she came up with the title for, of the film. You know, Peyton and I are sitting in the back of the room trying to figure out what the title of the movie would be. And Jess is like, well, I hear this phrase all the time, Speed and Angels, how about that? And we're like, yeah, that's, that's it. Genius. Well, meanwhile, um, and let's get the chronology right. Uh, again, you and I uh, are sort of kindred spirits, to put it mildly. You wrote a novel. In fact, I, I blurbed the novel. I got an early look at it before it was published called Lions of the Sky. So when did you start that idea and how's it gone since that uh, was published? Uh, I started it probably four years after uh, Speed Angels was done. Um, you know, I was hankering for another project. Uh, I stopped flying in the reserves. Um, so I had a lot of free time. And I've, like I said earlier, I've always been a writer. I, I enjoy the writing process. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think that the honest truth is I'd always wanted to be a novelist like yourself. Um, and I had just been afraid of that. What I knew was going to be an incredibly difficult process. So I finally just gutted up and, and sat down and just started, you know, I wrote out a long outline. It was probably a 70 page outline. Um, and I just started doing it and it took a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, and I wanted to quit probably two or three times, but uh, ultimately I think, you know, the book is exactly what I was hoping to write. It's a great, fun, meaningful novel, kind of like Punk's Wars. You know, it's not just a, uh, it's not just some sort of superficial dip your toe into the world of naval aviation with superhero like characters running around and saving the world. Um, you know, much like, Speed and Angels, I wanted to tell a story that dragged people into the world, but made it as realistic as possible. Um, and, you know, I, I think to a great degree, I achieved that. People that read it really like it. It's got great reviews on Amazon. Uh, you know, it's doing well. So I'm I'm very happy with how it turned out. No, it's it's fantastic. So if, if you're a viewer who has not read uh, Lines of the Sky, you, you, you need to. So, it, you know, definitely check that out. So there it is. The latest unorthodox project that, that you're involved in is a DCS campaign. And, and viewers of my channel uh, know I have entered the world of DCS um, and uh, have done several episodes about DCS hacks. And we had Nasty uh, come and, and fly the airplane. Uh, that episode did very well. You know, F-14 Tomcat flies DCS for the first time. I've transitioned to VR and DCS. Uh, but let's talk about the Speed and Angels campaign. Reflected Simulations calls me up and they're like, hey, listen, you know, your, your film Speed and Angels is very popular in the DCS world because it's a sort of a entry into, you know, pe people appreciate entering into that world that they want to be part of as well. And then Lines of the Sky um, also uh, was very popular. So he's like, will you write a DCS campaign? And I didn't even think about it. I said, yes, absolutely. It sounds like it's, it'd be super fun. Um, and as I got into it, uh, you know, I had to come up with the whole story. And, I, and the, the story I came up with was basically a mashup of Speed and Angels, the documentary, and Lines of the Sky, the book. So, uh, and I, you know, took the character that people are going to be playing was Megan Farley from the, the doc. Um, and I obviously asked her permission to do that. She was enthusiastically said yes. You know, it's 2006, Megan, the, the world is different than it 
than it uh, was in reality in 2006, but it's a campaign, it's fun. Uh, so that, you know, the, the scenario is the Chinese have hacked uh, into our uh, power grid and, and uh, made a, a few of the uh, reactors, uh, you know, explode. Um, and so all the rags have moved down to Nellis and that was driven by the fact that, you know, there's no Oceana maps for DCS. So we had to figure out a way to get everybody to Nellis and why they're in Nellis. Uh, and then Megan's going through the rags. There's 10 missions uh, where you go from FAMS to landing on the aircraft carrier. Um, and this was driven by the fact that when I was doing the commentary on um, on this DCS melee, um, I was struck by the fact that these people knew how to fly the plane. They knew the capabilities of the planes and the missiles, but they didn't really know anything about how we flew the planes in the Navy. It was just like... The way I describe it is just like Braveheart. They're just like, ah, you know, a bunch of planes coming at each other and shooting and turning around and running away and, you know, people yelling and, you know, and it was kind of fun and cool, but it was, there was a huge potential to educate uh, the DCS world into how, you know, the disciplined manner that a real fighter division would go and execute their tactics. So the rag is designed to take you through that. Like, this is how we fly. This is, you know, when you do a loop, this is how you're supposed to do a loop. Uh, you know, when you fly low levels, this is how you're supposed to do low levels. Um, air, air, air refueling, you know, you're going to need that. If you're going to be, you know, if you're going to take this as close as you possibly can to in real life, you need to air to air refuel. And so it's a rag instruction from beginning to end. I've literally had my natops out you know i'm leafing through the natops trying to remember all the checkpoints we use for you know flying formation you know that this you put this on that so that you're you know in the proper you know the proper position and uh, i i didn't remember any of that because we just once you learn it you learn it you just pull up and you're flying formation but i had to go back to the book to get into all well, of these what leading edge of the intake yeah. on the rios ejection yeah track. yeah yeah I didn't remember any of that. Yeah. And it's funny because I would ask, I asked Jay, I asked Megan, I asked my buddy, JJ Cummings, uh, who's a RAG instructor. I'm like, hey, do you guys remember any of this stuff? And they're like, no. <laughs> I, I remember that from my RAG instructor days. And it actually works. For a Rio, right? I, I, my yeah. mistake was I asked a bunch of pilots. Yeah, no, it's a huge instructor. mistake. Don't, what are you talking to pilots for? Come on. I don't know. But there was a whole bunch of instances like that where things that I had taken for granted because I'd been flying for so long you know, when you're trying to teach somebody how to do something as a student, you need to get the exact parameters and the exact air speeds. And, you know, the, and so I spent a lot of time going through the NATOPS and getting on. I mean, it's amazing what you can find online, you know, the uh, CV NATOPS online and, and going through all that. And, you know, I wanted it to be as accurate as possible. So the scenario builds, you know, the, the, the China factor builds as you're going through the rag. There's a sort of kind of rising, just like in Lines of the Sky, the book, as you're going, the, the students are going through the rag, there's this background drum beat of increasing tensions in the South China Sea. And, it, and for us, we don't have a South China Sea map at DCS, so we, we use Guam. Uh, and so at, at the end of the rag, now the Chinese have expanded through their, the, their region and they've invaded Guam. You finish the rag. The next thing you do is you get squadron assignments, and Megan gets assigned VF two thirteen, uh, and off she goes, steaming on the carrier to Guam uh, to try to evict the Chinese from Guam before they can reinforce their troops. We're going to have to get you flying DCS. I think that's going to be really humiliating, but sure, I'll do it. No, 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 no. It's not. And the reason I say it's not is because it's super realistic. And if you look at what Nasty does in the episode where I have him fly DCS, um, and you don't see this in the episode, but he went from the awkward, like weird switchology into the immersion part. And you could just see he suddenly was a rag instructor again. And that's where the camera starts rolling, where he's talking about trimming the airplane up and, you know, don't touch the stick, just use the throttle to alternate VSI. And, and it was just magic. And so when you see his first pass at Forrestal, it's a VFR straight in, um, that was actually his first pass. And he's a, it's rails. He lands a little bit left and actually he comments 
in the episode. Uh, he said, at this point, the air boss will say, hey, 101, yeah. see the center line? Yeah. <laughs> well, feel free to land on it next time. Yeah. You know? And so we got that paint um, there for a reason. Kid. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's, it brings back all of the, I mean, I've been at the 90. I'm like, I hope I get aboard because I'm really hungry. You know, yes. uh, and, and so it, I, the point I'm That's, making is if yeah. you get into it, I, I, I think you're going to find it's, it's incredibly realistic. For those who are intrigued and not part of DCS, uh, my recommendation is watch my DCS intro episode because it talks about how to start from scratch and then you'll learn how to obtain campaigns like Speed and Angels. This is all within your means. If you're listening to this, you're like, I would like to try this. And maybe this is the one campaign that, that gets you off dead center. Um, you know, uh, it, it is doable and, and I highly recommend it. So Paco, thank you so much for the time. Good luck as this campaign launches. Uh, last time I saw you was at Fallon uh, yeah. at the Oak Club last year. Yeah. yeah. So uh, hopefully we, we cross paths again uh, before hook 23, I'll be out for that. But if you're on the East coast, uh, particularly in Annapolis, uh, let, let's, let's get together. Uh, let's but I'm, I'm proud of you. You're, you're, you're pursuing the dream in an unorthodox way. Um, and, and so you're out there doing it. So, uh, good on you, brother. I gotta say, Mooch, that you and Stephen Coons were my inspirations to write the first book. So yeah. Stephen Coons was my inspiration. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and he was very generous with with uh, the advice in my you know manuscript days, back before there were cell phones or an internet. You know, I had a shoebox with yeah. what was called what punks do in the in those days. So, you know, folks who have labored to write a novel, it, it's almost beside the point whether it actually gets published or not, right? So, uh, as oh, you, no, I respect for, anybody for type A people. It's not. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, of course, but I mean, uh, anybody who's, who's cranked out a hundred thousand words and then shepherd those around through subsequent drafts, they have my respect again, whether or not it actually gets published. Obviously we're type A guys. We wanted to get to the world and, and the level of uh, impact you've had uh, with respect to that is a testament to just how you've lived your life. This is what made you a successful attack pilot, fighter pilot, uh, and so forth. So again, I'm very proud of you and thanks for coming on the channel today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, click the button and ring the bell so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.